evening. I am MJ Shores. I'm with Personal MBA Coach. We provide MBA admissions consulting and GMAT and GRE prep for prospective applicants to top MBA programs around the world. We were founded by Scott Edinburgh in 2008, who is a Wharton MBA grad, who also studied um, at MIT for his undergrad. And we have a placement rate of 96% of our clients at top programs all around the world. I would like to begin this session with giving you an insider's look into what happens when admissions directors review applications. As a former director at the Wharton School of Business and somebody who also worked at UCLA Anderson, I have a lot of intimate insight into this and certainly have a lot of exposure to other business schools as well. After we go over this, we will have a prospective candidate whose profile we will walk over and we will talk about their candidacy as if we were looking through an admissions view. So here's what really happens inside admissions. So before I do that, I would like to tell you a little bit more about Personal MBA Coach. We do have 15 years of professional experience across industries. We have been in the industry for 13 years. We're ranked number one on MBA Insight, number one on U.S as a number one consultant on leading consultant ranking, number one on business because. Uh, Scott Enberg, our co-founder or founder, has presented before AGAC, which is the Association of International Graduate Admissions Counselors. He's spoken at GMAC, the General Management Admissions Council. We have a 96% rate. And in 2019, our client secured $5.5 million in scholarships. We are boutique. As I mentioned earlier, we do comprehensive GMAT, GRE, EA tutoring. We have former M7 MBA admissions directors on our team. We have early MBA planning through post acceptance support. We have interviewers from MBA's M7 MBA programs who have been intimately involved in the schools and we have former clients that you can network with and learn a lot about schools and what their admissions process was like. So here let's look at what actually happens behind the curtain. First, who's on the admissions committee? This can vary by school size and the school philosophy. Committees can include recruiting staff such as admissions recruiters, career office staff, outside readers, and sometimes it can even include people from the academic side of a program who assess people's academic fit for the school. Large programs may have second year students reading applications, interviewing and making recommendations. Um, a few schools sometimes even include faculty or deans on the committee. So what is the admissions committee looking for? Regardless of the committee makeup, there are four things that they look for. Academic ability, not surprisingly. The last thing schools wanna do is admit people who are at risk of not graduating. I actually, when I was at Wharton, saw someone who was asked to leave after a year because they did not do well. And that creates a really awkward position for somebody to have to explain what happened in that one year where they had a work gap. We do look at academic ability based on undergraduate grades and courses, as well as the GMAT, or the GRE. There can be a correlation between your test scores and your success in the first year of the program because they show your ability to master certain quantitative areas in particular. So we also look at relevant work experience. What kind of experiences do you have to contribute to the classroom? All schools are trying to craft a diverse class and diversity is not just ethnicity or gender, it's also professional background. So contrary to popular opinion, MBA programs don't accept primarily people from banking, investment banking, private equity, accounting, consulting. They also accept people from the nonprofit arena, people who've worked in startups, people who've worked strictly in IT. They love variety. So whatever relevant work your experience can be helpful. Uh, also, we look at the professional experience that you can apply to your future career. So as part of your application, 
we try to look at how well you can describe the logic behind the goal you want to pursue after an MBA. Is the goal linked to things in your past? Is it influenced by things in your past? Or is it a reasonable thing that you could do with the benefit of an MBA? Also, in part of the application, we're also looking to see how self-aware you are about your own abilities and your own flaws. People come to an MBA sometimes to accelerate their career growth, and also because they have the insight to know what the gaps in their experience are. Maybe you work in consulting, but you haven't had a chance to work in accounting or finance, and you wanna start your own business, and you know that those skills are gonna be important. The value of an MBA is that you gain experience and academic awareness across disciplines. So as you move up in an organization, you understand the language of the accountant, of the, C of, of the financial people, of the operations folks. So you can come to a common understanding of how to move the organization ahead. Do you have a focused career path? One of the biggest mistakes applicants make is to just say, well, I want an MBA. I want a degree because I'm bored with my job. I just think I deserve more. And that's great as a starting point. But what exactly do you want to do? Part of what admissions officers assess is not whether or not an MBA just makes sense for you, but is now the right time. And part of now being the right time is knowing how informed your decision is. This is critical because whether you go to a one-year program or a two-year program, the time goes by very, very quickly. And if you're not focused, you can then graduate and feel like you didn't spend your time in a most focused or useful means possible. And do you understand what your future career path means? It's not unusual for somebody to go, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> and they've never done anything entrepreneurial in their past. And the fact is 75 to 90% of all startups fail. So understanding why that makes sense for you and how it fits in with your temperament and your past experience is always very helpful. And then what is your vision for how you're going to drive some kind of impact? Um, it, it should be something beyond a lofty goal of wanting to start your own business or I want to make a difference and have an impact on the world and work in social enterprise. How do you want to drive impact? Like maybe you want to work in medical devices because you see a real need to advance that area to help promote health and wellness and help cure diseases, right? Or maybe you do want to run a nonprofit because you want to see some real live action taken maybe in micro investments that help micro enterprises. So all of this is just a matter of your being informed and there is no right or wrong career path or goal. It And there's no right or wrong rationale. It's just showing that you've taken the time to think through it and show the admissions committee that you know what you're getting into. So, we also want a strong reason for pursuing an MBA. Um, a lot of people just simply want the degree, right? Or they want it for the network. And those are fine reasons, but those are just the starting points. So when you look at different programs, because there are thousands and thousands of them around the world, we hope that you're going for, to a school for something more than the parchment that you hang on the wall and more than the pedigree or the ranking, but that you actually know about the program and things that it offers. Some schools are better at entrepreneurship than others. Some are better known as quant schools and they're better at finance and investment banking and private equity. Others are more general management that prepare you for maybe going into a corporate rotational program where you move up the ranks of a different um, corporation. And then understanding how an MBA will help you. Not just, again, that it's a degree, but are there gaps in your experience that you need? Um, do you need to understand how to interpret a balance sheet and understand what debits and credits are because you've never been exposed to them? Maybe you have worked in a very technical area and you haven't had a chance to develop leadership skills or managerial skills, 
And so you want the experience of an MBA to develop those skills, maybe even learn how to negotiate in a safe environment where the downside is less than if you're working in a real business. And then identify the fit of a program for you. So the fit is yes, the academics, but it's also the culture. And it's also where the alumni go. Um, are they going to areas that you wanna be in? both in terms of their industry, their professional, their profession, their regional exposure. And culture is also the type of people uh, the school attracts. And those vary. Most schools have a lot of information available to you to help you assess that. But those reasons really need to be well thought out. Many applicants are denied not because they couldn't complete a program and not because an MBA would not be a good thing for them, but because they haven't really thought out well what the program is good for them. And also part of this is how are you going to contribute to the school and how are you going to give back and how are you going to enhance the learning environment and the community around you? So let's look at the application review process. People have questions about this and it really is an art as opposed to a science, which actually works to your advantage because you may have a profile that statistically looks very standard. And in fact, there may be other aspects of your personality or what you do in your free time that help you stand out. So what happens when the application is received? Generally, there's a quick review by an operations team in the MBA admissions and financial aid office. They check to make sure all the documents required for the application are included. Um, if there are missing items. They will communicate to the applicant. We're missing a letter of recommendation. We do not have your GMAT score. And they will notify you that until they receive it, you will not be considered for admission. Then you generally have a first evaluation by a senior staff member just to see if you're qualified. Some schools will distribute these to all of the staff. And this is just basically looking to see if you're academically qualified, if you have a professional background that makes sense for an MBA based on the types of skills you've acquired, um, also based on the letters of recommendation, your test scores, everything. Then the most competitive applicants from that first view um, are invited to the interview. And just so you know, in that first evaluation, that's still pretty thorough. They read the application front to back, and it's not just looking over a sheet that just summarizes everything. So you get fully vetted before the most competitive candidates are invited to the interview. So how is the interview used? That's a great question. It is used to assess the candidate's personality and interpersonal skills. So what it does is add some qualitative depth and dimension to what we see in your written application. And it gives us a sense of what you'd be like to live with and to work with. And sometimes it gives life, you know, to an applicant. It's not unusual for people from maybe IT backgrounds, um, engineers, you hate to stereotype, but to be a little cut and dried in how they present their applications relative to maybe consultants. So then you interview them and you get a sense of who they are and that can add some nice perception and depth that can be used to assess you. And the goal is to ascertain if your goals are feasible. Sometimes people have goals that just don't make sense based on their profile, that don't make sense based on what's going on in the market. So we look at that very carefully because every program wants to make sure that their graduates are able to successfully secure jobs once they graduate. And it's the interviews are also to find out, frankly, if you're coachable. Do you have the ability to learn and grow, to take feedback and respond to that well, as opposed to somebody who is sort of dogmatic and very structured and set in their ways and not willing to grow. It's also to evaluate your interest in the program. Um, schools wanna know that you're really excited to be at their program and that you've done the homework so that you know it's gonna be a good fit. The last thing they want is people applying to the school and then getting there and being very unhappy because their expectations 
were not based on reality or based in any research. So what do you know about the program? Are you really interested? Are there particular faculty members there whose research interests you? Or are there courses that are appealing to you? Are there centers of excellence that hold programs or conferences that you like? All of those things come into play. They're also trying to predict your future performance. So when admissions officers look at your file, they're looking not only at what you've done to date and what you've demonstrated in the past, but they're also looking at your capacity for growth. And so how are you gonna grow in an MBA? And also, how are you gonna be able to present yourself to a corporate interviewer or a high ranking alumni when you graduate and you're looking to network and secure a job? We're also frankly trying to determine if you are hireable. Are there any red flags that would indicate that you're gonna be a difficult person in a work setting? Certainly you can be strong and you can be challenging, but do you work well with others? And also it's a chance for you in the interview to discuss information that's not in your application. So for example, maybe there's a gap in your work experience or like recently, there have been a number of people laid off. Maybe you want to explain what you've done with your time during that period. Maybe you want to explain that you've been involved in some other activities or enhancing your candidacy and profile during that time. Maybe there's something you're concerned with academically that you would like people to know. Maybe you started off your first year in college, which is not unusual, not doing well. You went away from home to study and um, had a difficult time adjusting for multiple reasons, but you wanna highlight the upward trend. Probably it was already noticed, but it's, it's your, your opportunity. And it's also an opportunity for you to ask some questions about the schools. And you should ask questions about the schools, uh, probing more deeply about the culture or things that are not clear to you from what you see on their website and marketing material. And it's a wonderful opportunity for you to get to know the school. So what happens after a negative interview experience? Sometimes it will lead to a wait list or a rejection. And sometimes a bad interview can be considered an outlier and overlooked. I remember interviewing somebody once who was very, very ill. It had the flu or a cold or something and clearly was not on his best performance. And I wrote up an assessment of the interview and said, you know, the interview wasn't great. It was kind of mediocre, but he was ill. Um, he clearly is driven and committed and wants this. If there's, if the application is otherwise strong, I think it would be great just to go ahead and give him the benefit of the doubt. So it is very much something that is not necessarily a make or break you deal. It can certainly enhance your profile. Um, just do the best you can. So now what happens after a good interview? What happens is your interview is placed back into the application and it goes to another evaluator. Sometimes the additional read is blind, so the reader doesn't see any of the comments of any of the other prior reviewers, which could have been one or three or more, and has no access to those notes, or they may see it in conjunction with everything else that has been written. Then the application will either go to the admissions director or it is presented to the entire admissions committee for final review and decision. The most, most of the cases that are dealt with in the admissions committee fall into those cases where the applicants are borderline or they're in certain files. And this is sometimes when people from career management or academic services will be brought in to weigh in with a candidate. And at that point, then people will have a discussion about candidates to see whether they want to admit them, put them on the wait list or deny them. So then it usually is a team vote. Sometimes the admissions director will simply pass the clear admits and clear denies on for processing. These are ones that everybody would universally agree on and the team then would discuss probably only the main candidates, maybe ones. So decisions, decisions vary by school. 
Some are on a rolling basis or on a specified date. Schools' websites will explain to you how they release decisions. If you are denied in any round in a given admission cycle or application cycle, you have to wait till the next year to reapply. A reapplication is not a negative thing, and many reapplicants are admitted because they've enhanced their candidacy. Some schools will offer feedback at the end of the year, but not during the application period. So they'll go through your file for maybe like 15 minutes and uh, suggest you areas you could work on to enhance your candidacy. Some do not do it, they do not dis discuss the decision. But in my experience, if people take a few months off and kind of let everything gel and they look at their application with fresh eyes. They frankly see for themselves where they could have done a better job. So let's talk about the wait list. So if you are waitlisted, some schools do offer feedback to help you improve. Um, some do not. So check the policy of each school. Schools tend to be very transparent and put the information on their website. It is possible to get off the wait list and that's good because it means the school likes something about you and your application. You would not have made it to the wait list if they didn't. And sometimes people are put on the wait list on like in round one, schools can heavily populate a wait list because they wanna see kind of how round two looks because it's often frequently as heavy as round one in terms of application volume. Some schools will allow the submission of additional information on the wait list such as a job promotion or an additional letter of recommendation. Others allow, allow updated GMAT or other test scores. Some do not. Sometimes it's simply a matter of volume or it's for philosophical reasons. Check the school's website. Don't take it personally if they don't take additional information. You should also figure out what your weakness is and start working on it. There are times when there is no weakness in a candidate. There are just too many qualified applicants at the time. That happens very frequently. Uh, when I worked at Wharton, we would get 10,000 applications a year. And there were people who were great. There were just too many other better qualified applicants, but there was really nothing you could find wrong in the people who were waitlisted. So again, a little more information about Personal MBA Coach. Our clients did receive $6 million last year in financial aid at the schools they went to. Here are some of the sample schools our clients got into. You'll recognize most of them, if not all of them, Stanford, Wharton, Kellogg, Chicago Booth, Harvard, Tuck, NSAOD, Michigan, Johnson, Yale, Duke, LBS, NYU, and certainly we have applicants who choose other schools that are not in this mix because they're a really great fit for their background. And when there are more than 4,000 MBA programs around the world, there are lots of great programs that appear at all levels in the rankings. So this is how we can help you. We can help you with GMAT, GRE tutoring, and initial brainstorming where we help you figure out your story and how you're going to present that throughout your application process. We help you develop your story, like what are those things in your life that have really shaped who you are and both in your personal life and at work and your career going forward. We help you with essay content development, uh, which is an area most people struggle with how to edit your resume for an MBA program, which is different than for business, how to select a school that is a good shot for you, as opposed to ones that are just purely reaches. Those are fine too, but we help you figure the best mix. We help you edit essays. We do not write them for you so that we can preserve your authentic voice, but we help you with that. Help you uh, identify letters of recommendation and things that should be included to help support the rest of your application and we conduct mock interviews. We do have M7 graduates who are experts in how the different schools conduct their interviews. If you'd like more information, you can email Scott, Scott Edinburgh, the founder of Personal MBA Coach at scott at personalmbacoach.com or you can visit our website, personalmbacoach.com. You can also download, download our MBA planning kickoff start guide 
and that's also available on our website. Thank you for your time. Well, hello, hello VC. Hello, hello, thank, uh, MJ. Thank you so much for sharing the insights about the schools. And thank you for taking out time for evaluating my profile. Uh, yeah, so well, I'll just go ahead and give a quick introduction about myself. Uh, that would be great. Uh, sure. So I, uh, ever since my childhood, I was a computer and technology enthusiast uh, since I got my first computer. So I went on and uh, joined a YMCA university and graduated as a computer engineer uh, in 2010, uh, 2014. So uh, since the last six years, I've been uh, a part of uh, a leading Korean consumer electronics company. And I have experience of working in international and diverse environments as well and leading uh, multiple cross-cultural and cross-functional teams. Uh, I realized that now it is time to revamp my leadership skills, as you mentioned, and overcome uh, shortcomings in terms of limited business understanding. So I look forward to an MBA. And post my MBA, I uh, look forward to joining a technology conglomerate uh, in a product management role in the short term. And uh, in the long term, I uh, look forward to starting my own ed tech venture. Wonderful. So when I look at your background, it, I, I know you won't be surprised, but there are many, many people <laughs> or IT people from India applying to a lot of the programs that you're looking at. So the first question I have for you is you have a BE in computer engineering. You say top government university. What is that university? Uh, the university is YMCA University of Science and Technology in Faridabad. So it's one of the top uh, government state universities in India. OK, so I would recommend that as part of your candidacy and you, I'm sure you'll you'll have it with your transcripts. It's always good to let people know um, admissions officers are aware of the different schools throughout India and kind of how they compare with one another. So um, an 8.99 out of 10. How would you compare that with the rest of your class? How does that performance measure up? Uh, so I was uh, I was in the top 10 percent uh, of my class uh, during undergraduation. Perfect. That's a good thing to know. So you've been six years at a leading Korean consumer electronics company with international experience. So have you worked abroad? Uh, yes, I do have experience working abroad. I have led multiple teams uh, while working in South Korea, and I also have experience working at the United States uh, in New York City and Seattle. Wonderful. So that is something you'd probably want to put on your resume. So when you say that you've led teams, tell me a little bit about the teams. Uh, sure. So uh, I uh, work on Android applications, uh, basically. So I've led uh, multiple cross-functional teams. I say that because I've led teams with people from different roles. Uh, I've led teams where there were developers, where there were quality analysts or testers, and where there were designers as well. And uh, during my uh, experience while working at the United States, I've uh, got opportunities to lead teams from with members coming from different backgrounds, coming from different countries. There were members from India, South Korea, the United States, Spain. So those were the kind of diverse teams that I have uh, got an opportunity to lead while uh, working. Wonderful. That That's great experience. So with project, with product management and leading teams, have you earned any kind of project management certifications or anything related to project management? Uh, not uh, really product management certifications, but I've uh, I've really grown into a role wherein I am managing a number of project uh, products for my organization right now. 
Okay. Uh, so my while initially my role was more on the technical side and the research and development gradually i've had opportunities to work with the product planning and strategy team as well and i've got to know how uh, those teams work and how they strategize uh, for various products for global uh, markets all across the world okay i would say that uh, in terms of your candidacy that's a great thing uh, not a lot of IT people before an MBA make the transition from a purely technical role into managing and leading teams, particularly cross-functional teams. So that's a really strength, a great strength in your candidacy. I do think your exposure to all of these different cultures is also an asset. Um, that's not always real common either. So I think it's a great thing. You've taken advantage of those opportunities. So then you say your post MBA goals are to do product management at a leading tech conglomerate. Tell me a little bit more about that. Uh, sure. So uh, uh, after the like six successful years at my organization, I've realized how uh, technology can impact the lives of millions of people all over the world and how technology and business uh, are right at the intersection right now. So my short term goal is to join an organization that really uh, takes technology and innovation and uses them to uh, impact the lives of people and really make the world a better place to live in. So initially, uh, I want to gain skills uh, that help me uh, grow into a better product manager for the short term and in the long term, I want to start my own education venture and apply technology for that. So my long term goal is due to the fact that uh, as a part of the CSR group at my organization, I have seen uh, the gap within the education system that exists in the country and how uh, technology can really uh, bridge that gap and in, enhance the opportunities for the students who come from socially and economically marginalized areas. So that is something what I want to do in the long run. Okay, so I do see that you have exposure to education through your extracurriculars. Um, have you had any kind of exposure to startups or being an entrepreneur? Uh, I have I've had uh, multiple experiences by leading certain committees uh, while during my undergraduation and I was uh, the head of certain societies and uh, there were ventures wherein we had to, uh, you know, collect scholarships for various events and uh, events during the festivals and during the various events for my undergraduation. So that is somewhat related to uh, the entrepreneurial experience that I have, but not any concrete entrepreneurial experience as of as of now. Okay, and so when you talk about an ed tech venture, can you tell me a little bit more about what that would mean? Like uh, that would uh, sure. So that would mean uh, using technology to create products uh, that would really bridge the ecosystem gap this, that exists within the education system in the country and. Uh, really not uh, focus more on the profit side of it, but rather give back to the community and really apply technology and innovation that exists in uh, today's world to provide better education to the youth of the country and then maybe expand it uh, to a global level as well. Okay, so based on what you've told me, my recommendation for you, if I were just to read your application based on what you would to told me, I would think your goals were great they're idealistic but i'd want them fleshed out a little bit more so you talked about a conglomerate you talked a little about working towards social good or whatever but i didn't get a sense of what kind of conglomerate is there a particular i mean technology spans many many different industries right so i'd want to know more uh exactly where you're thinking of working is there any kind of company or any kind of sector that's really appealing to you it's not just technology you're looking at, but especially if you're thinking of doing ed tech, are you interested in doing something in the education tech field in a conglomerate that is tied to that in some way? Then in terms of ed tech, you have great ideas and you say all the right things like, well, I want to work on products that help fill gaps in the ecosystems. Those sound great, but again, they sound a little lofty. So. With ed tech, do you want to work with universities? 
Do you want to work with lower levels? Do you want to work with community uh, organizations that provide educational technology and access to people? So getting a little more focused then would show that you've researched it to know what you want to do. And that can differentiate you from a run of the mill applicant who has these ideas that are great, but hasn't really fleshed them through. And sometimes applicants are denied because we feel like they need more time to figure it out. So those things would, I mean, I think they make sense with your background. Certainly um, you're utilizing and leveraging the product management experience you have, your engineering background, your managerial background. And so my question for you also would be, if I were to ask you, Let's say this is part of your application too, and part of your profile is your ability to explain why you want an MBA. Why do you want an MBA, DC? Uh, uh, sure. So uh, I've uh, uh, while working on the product side at my organization, I realized that uh, being at the technical side of it, while I do have a say on how we design a product, I really don't have uh, much of a say in what kind of products. Uh, we design or what kind of products we uh, should go forward with so that is one change that i want to make to my profile uh, being on the technical side uh, at, uh, for a number of successful years uh, for now i realize that it is now time to me uh, to enhance the business landscape of technological trends uh, in a better way and at the same time i uh, want to overcome the uh, shortcomings in terms of limited business understanding that I have uh, due to the fact that I have never received a formal business education uh, and uh, at the same time uh, build a strong network uh, to help achieve my uh, short term as well as long term goals that I've shared are the reasons that I look forward uh, to an MBA. Okay, so your first explanation about what you would like to do at work sounds more like a reason to get a new job than an MBA. Um, I appreciate the fact that you want to get business training, but I would want to know more as an admissions person, what exactly are those business areas that you feel like you need that an MBA is going to give you? So like with your background, you might argue that you need to understand more like strategic management, right? How to set strategy, how to, to figure out the growth of the organization. You might also say something like, um, maybe you do want to learn some more leadership skills, right? Um, to help enhance the skills you've already developed. Maybe you do want to learn more about finance so you can understand how businesses are structured um, and understand what kind of drives profitability. So knowing a little bit of that would help. Um, and certainly your rationale is good. Again, just dig a little more deeply. So I, I think in general, your, your profile could be really, really strong. And I think you've got a lot that differentiates you um, because you've already made that transition into management, into leading teams. And I think it's just fleshing out your goals why you want an MBA. And then if I were to ask you, why do you want one now? Because you're, you're six years out. That's, that's pretty much right in line with the average of people applying to MBAs. But, but, but why is now a good time? You've alluded to it. Uh, uh, sure. It's, it's just that uh, I've had the realization uh, after working for all these years uh, in diverse environments, I can see that uh, I... Uh, do need to revamp my leadership skills and at the same time uh, uh, upgrade my toolkit which I have uh, right now so it, 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 the MBA would just be a start to upgrading my toolkit and gain all the required skills that would not only help me evolve into a better and effective leader in the future but uh, would also help me achieve uh, my long-term vision okay so tell me lead vocalist what kind of music do you play uh so i've uh i was the lead vocalist and the uh, head of the music society during my university so during the university i was into multiple genres like rock uh classical uh bollywood and multiple genres uh, which i used to sing uh after joining my organization i uh brought it here as well and i am currently the lead vocalist of the in-house band at my organization as well so uh, now uh 
it is more of a modern classical and uh, a mix of uh, rock at times ah uh, who are some of your favorite rock artists uh linkin park chester bennington was my inspiration ah okay so based on your profile what do you have questions for me beyond what we've discussed uh sure i do have a one question uh okay. i uh, i have listed uh, the the target mba programs that i plan to apply so uh, is the list uh, is the list of schools that i'm looking at uh, the right is it a right mix of schools i should apply or uh, could you please suggest any other names that i could go ahead and add to that list that could that could align with my career goals Yeah, I'd look need to look a little more closely at their class profiles. Um but w- with your with what I see on your GMAT and GPA, I think that all of these make sense and what I really like is you have a nice mix of schools, right? So um which I think is always great when you're applying so that you've got some that vary a little bit in their rankings right and as we discussed rankings aren't everything so i th- i think um hoss is certainly really good because of, of its location right really close to high tech and all of that kind of stuff and and i know they do some stuff in the ed tech space ross is good uh just because they're a great program and and they have nice cross cutting curriculum stern to new york where there's a lot of interesting stuff going on Um Anderson is good because there is a lot of startup activity in Southern California. Um Tepper and Foster are both great schools and they're nice in the sense that they're very community based if you're looking for a school like that and then you know MIT Sloan is also a wonderful school. So I think those kind of make sense. You probably want to aim for they say 5 to 7 schools and you have 4 7 8 um and so you might want to look just a little more closely at their class profiles and what they'll do is they'll list the mid 80% but i i don't think any of these are out of range for you and i think they're a great mix thank you and it looks thank like you so you've given answer. some real thought into them it looks like you just didn't um they look like you've been thoughtful about them and the one thing you'll need to think about too is class size but it looks like most of them tend to be a little smaller than some of the large schools which says something about your personality too so yeah thank you thank you so much yeah any other questions or uh, uh no the uh, the insights you shared were really helpful and i really uh, would work on those and really flesh out my goals in a more concrete manner and that was really helpful thank you thank you so much for taking out time oh you're welcome i think you have a lot of great qualities and i think you could you could end up being a really great candidate and and uh, as you. you know as you've probably figured out by now i'm pretty direct so i i really think you could be a great candidate thank you thank you so much yeah thank you very much hello rishi hi and how are you doing i'm well how are you I'm doing fine. Well, I'm from Barcelona. Oh, you're in Barcelona? Yes, absolutely. Ah, you live there? Right. So, a little quick introduction about myself. I am Rishi Bagaria. I'm currently pursuing my full-time MBA at ESA Business School in Barcelona. So, ah, yeah, I'm here for the next 18 months. Ah, that's, that's wonderful. That's your question. Yeah. Yeah, well, so I uh, just for people who are on this session, Uh, you are going to be talking a little bit about your experience with personal MBA coach and certainly feel free to throw in uh, a little bit about what it's like being in Barcelona and being in business school and um would love to hear your thoughts absolutely um so about okay essentially being in Barcelona it's one of the most wonderful cities that you can probably be in and yeah, about ESA business school it's one of the most competitive business schools in the world top one in the Europe for the executive MBA it's been ranked number one time and again so it's certainly the most aggressive MBA and one of the most intensive ones that you can ever have but the experience is amazing it's been pretty amazing going back a little in time to talking about my application process and about the same time when i was doing my applications with personal MBA coach okay um a a general health disclaimer i absolutely 
I'm going to give an unbiased opinion on Scott Edinburgh, even though I love him as a human being. This is like an absolute unbiased opinion on personal MBA coach. I have worked with him through and through my applications right from the start to the end of the process, which essentially meant developing all my ap- application essays, my resume, as well as my interview prep. And the experience was phenomenal. Um, I know candidates that usually tend to fret a lot about the application process. But trust me, that's the only time of the MBA experience that you're going to be able to enjoy. And you would want to do that. Um, I was in the same position as many of you guys are currently. And I was scared. But um, when I look back in time, I realized that I enjoyed the application process with MBA coach, you know. Like the other day, I just hopped on to a call with Scott. And those are our usual catch-up calls that, that we do on and off time. And I told him that, you know, I, I thought the process would be very, very scary to apply to business schools because your future hinges on it. But I actually had a good time doing my stories. So a, a few quick insights about how the application process with Scott Edinburgh works. Like MJ Shores was mentioning earlier, also like MJ was mentioning earlier, a lot of what they do would be very helpful with your MBA later because once you get into the MBA is when you realize the importance of why, you know, they stress so much about why the MBA and essentially developing the stories because you want a very clear head and a clear vision in your in perspective when you do the MBA, you know, like once you have the stories developed and you know why you want to do the MBA, it makes your journey a lot more easier. I didn't realize it back then that why are they stressing out so much? You know, like I would like Scott would reiterate this to me so many times and I'd be like, you know, in my head, I'd be like, oh, why does he bother so much about why do I want to do an MBA? And, you know, <laughs> but but now that I'm pursuing my full time MBA and the process is so intense and rigorous, you realize that it often doesn't leave you time to think and ponder on all those questions. So if you come back to the MBA with those answers in your head, it makes it a lot more easier for sure. And it also helps in your career applications going forward, your recruitment. Uh, that's that's one good thing that you know MJ covered and it's really really useful what she said about Scott Edinburgh about personal MBA coach I have had the best time of my life with him so it's not like those big consultancy firms where you'd be probably handed over to some consultants and they will just you know run you by a pool of applications and then you know they'll just time and probably you know they'll they'll give you very few minutes of your time and talk to you like spares very sparsely once in a month. Scott Edinburgh will personally look after each and every application of yours with all the business schools that you do. It's Scott who himself works on the essays. Obviously, he has a team for his editing and reviewing all of that. But any queries that you have with any essays, you can hop on to a call with him anytime and he'll be more than glad to assist you. I was in also I was in India. And he's based out of US. So we are completely different time zones. <laughs> and that'd be times when it's my morning and his night. But he would still take 4 a.m. calls for me because I had some applications due. I have done some applications really, really on short, short in time and stretch with time. And he still assisted me with those. Like MG was mentioning, they will not edit your essays deep dive because they want to hold the essence of your language, your perspective. But they will still suggest on what stories can you cut back on, scale back on. And what are the stories you want to emphasize on? And what would bring out the best in your stories for the essays? So that's really, really uh, a nice part of what he does. Another highlight and a standard point for me for personal MBA coach is the project management tool that he uses. It's a very, very, very real time tool. Like you upload your essays onto this tool and it sends a notification to Scott and to you as well once you upload it. Once he sees those uh, essays, he will provide you with real time feedback and you can see it in your email box as well. The Im- immediately when he sends an update on the essays. So it's a really, really nice cohesive tool that he uses, which I think is absolutely fa- fabulous. No doubt about that. So uh, those are like two standpoints for me. Um, other than that, I was very confused about what schools should I select given my profile. I worked in the financial services sector in India for about five years. I've done a bit of consulting and I was looking to pivoting to consulting post my MBA. So my goals were clear, but my schools weren't irony. And uh, I, I honestly had a very hard time, but uh, Scott is very honest. He's he, can, he you might find it to for I find it him to be rude at times, but he's absolutely <laughs> candid. He say that this tool doesn't work for you and this tool works for you. 
so he's not going to sugarcoat his advice which is what i think you absolutely need at this stage of your career when you are doing your applications you want a realistic view of whether you actually have a shot at the school that you are applying to else your efforts will go to vain and wh- while he will diversify the risk for you he will ask you to apply to the best schools in the world but he'll also have ask you to have a safety net in place which i think is a very very good strategy in place you know he'll i i like that about him like there's absolute candid feedback coming at every point of time in life you know or there could be times where he will ask you to scrap your essay completely and i'd be like oh i just worked four hours on that essay and i'm going to scrap it away and he'd be like no that essay is shit that needs to go yeah that will <laughs> happen but trust him trust the process he's been in the business for years he knows what he's doing he's good at it and i'm sure you will you will essentially land a good business school so that oh, really? that's my experience with personal mba coach well thank you rishi that you share a lot of great information and uh and i'm glad you appreciate this directness i think it is a real asset um absolutely absolutely yes cuz the goal is to help you right i mean that's the end goal is to make sure you're successful yeah well, absolutely i i think it is very essential and crucial because you are your mind gets so clouded at a point of time because you're doing so many applications you're going so much of processes you're seeing people around you you, you kind of get hazy and cloudy in the way and you want somebody who can clear that out for you and say that hey you know what this is not going to work or hey the school might not be your best shot or oh, or also by the way so there were some schools i was like oh i'm not hopeful about getting in and scott would be like i'm i am very sure that you will and you know like so you need that kind of push and a motivation factor to like at times go that extra mile and do it so yeah i, I mean the journey is very tiring the application process is daunting i am going to agree to it 100% and i thought that a consultant would make it all the more tougher scott is a very hard task master he's like a super hard task master but i was absolutely overjoyed with the process okay i don't say this because i got the business school of my choice but i genuinely like when i look back in time i enjoyed the application process i definitely did most definitely wonderful well thank you for taking time i know you're really busy and you worked us into your schedule today so Thank oh, you. Any, absolutely anything for personal MB and Scott, you know. If we said we share a great bond and I mean anything for him at any point of the time in life. So, no worries at all. Uh oh. if, if if any questions, if anybody else has any questions about ESA about Scott about the I mean how to go about your applications, feel free to shoot an email to me or you can reach out to Scott and he'll he'll be the best person to guide you to me or direct you to me. So you could do that as well. Wonderful. Well, enjoy Barcelona. I'm oh, a little absolutely. envious, but <laughs> congratulations and um I hope to run into you again soon. Absolutely. Pleasure talking to you MJ. Thank you so much for, you know, putting me up here and making me a part of your session. Thank you so much. You're welcome. My pleasure. See you, See you around. Thank you. Bye. Take care.